Well, I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you think the world is getting better or the world's getting worse? How many uh, think the world's getting, and you can't go wrong here because there can make a case either way. How many think the world's getting better? Raise your hand. Nice and high. Okay, how many think the world is getting worse? Okay, you guys win. <laughs> now, I suppose it all depends on what you're measuring. If you're measuring uh, length of life, we're living longer. World's getting better. If you're measuring child mortality, a lot less children die in childbirth today. The world's getting better. If you're measuring birth mom mortality, a lot less women lose their lives in childbirth. So the world's getting better. If you measure diseases that have nearly been eradicated by vaccines, the world's getting better. If you measure all that we have with technology today, the world's getting better. All kinds of ways you could measure for getting better. Worse, if you measure the production of pornography and the consumption of pornography, the world is getting worse. If you measure how many children are born out of wedlock, how many people live together before they get married, the world's getting worse. If you measure the number of people with drug addictions, it's getting worse. If you measure terrorism, ISIS sweeping through towns, raping all the women, people fleeing for their lives, people being ruthlessly killed, terrorist attacks and planes, the world's getting worse. From the Bible's perspective, we look for both, the world to get better and the world to get worse. Better is right in the beginning of Genesis. God says to the first people, exercise dominion over the earth. That means you are to, as human beings, lead this earth and make it a better place. And then Jesus, in the New Testament, says to believers, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. As salt of the earth, you are to preserve this world from getting more evil. And as the light of the world, you're to shine the light of Jesus into the world, into the, the sin-filled world, and show them the forgiveness and life that is available in Jesus Christ. We help the world get better. So I want to talk to you today about this worldwide battle with evil good versus evil, how can we help this world become a better place? Now, with the worldwide evil, a lot of that is out of our control. There's just not much we can do about it, but we can do something about the choices we make for our own lives. So I want to limit my discussion of how can we win the battle over evil in our own lives. So we're contributing to making this a better world. In the first century, some people in Galatia, which was the place where Paul, the Apostle Paul, planted his first churches in that province, began to teach that since Christ died to free us from the law, believers can live any way they want. We can sin. We can be, you know, evil. Doesn't matter because Jesus will forgive us. Remember, Paul came into these four cities in the province of Galatia and said, you cannot be made right with God by obedience to the law. God's standard is too high. We all fall short. The only way you can make a right relationship with God is through grace, Christ's death on the cross, dying for your sins. So you're freed from the demands of the law. Well, then after Paul left town, people we call Judaizers came in and said, you know, Paul's not right. A relationship with Christ, his grace is not enough to get you right with God. You have to be circumcised and keep all the Old Testament law. And Paul wrote them, the book of Galatians, and said, no, no, no. You can't be saved by keeping the law. You all fail. We all fail. We fall short. The only way you can ma be made right with God is through the grace of God through Jesus' death on the cross. Well, then, some of the Galatians took that and concluded, well, if it's all by grace and we're freed from the law, then we can live any way we want. 
We can be as bad as we want because we can get forgiveness. Christ freed us from the tyranny of having to keep the law to earn salvation, something we could never do. But he didn't free us to live any way we want. He freed us from sin. He didn't free us to sin. Before we come to know Christ, we have no choice but to be selfish and make poor choices and do evil. But once we give our lives to Christ, he gives us the Holy Spirit who gives us the will and the desire to do what is right. We don't have to be totally self-centered, living only for ourselves. We can learn to do good and love others. Do you battle with self-centeredness? I do. Mother was scolding her young boy. She said, I told you, don't be selfish with your toys. Let your younger brother use the cho toys half the time. He says, that's what I'm doing. I take the sled down the hill and he takes it up. <laughs> How can we win this battle with selfishness? How can we do our part in this world to make this a better world by overcoming evil in our own lives? The Apostle Paul shows us a way in Galatians 5, 13 to 26. Turn to Galatians. There's a Bible under every seat in front of you, I believe. Starts, verse 13, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So, you know, he cites the problem. Some people were saying, okay, we're free from the law. We can indulge the flesh. We can live any way we want. Christ's death on the cross gives us freedom to approach God without fear, but not the freedom to live any way we please. Paul tells us uh, every believer experiences a conflict between the sinful nature and the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do what you want. When we invite Christ into our lives, the Holy Spirit comes to reside in us. His presence does not destroy the sin nature inside of us. It doesn't mean there's an end to the conflict. If anything, the conflict increases. Our sinful nature is there and the Holy Spirit comes in. Now, if you're not a follower of Christ, I don't mean that you don't have a conflict. Every human being in this world has to deal with the conflict between good and evil. But when you become a Christian, the battle increases because the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. Paul proceeds to catalog the types of behavior to which the two natures are prone. He starts with the manifestations of the sinful nature. He categorizes them into four realms. First, there is the realm of sex, verse 19. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery. These Greek words refer to any kind of sexual activity outside of God's design for sexual intimacy. It's between a man and a woman within marriage. So it refers to premarital sex, extramarital sex, homosexuality, pornography, or something else. Then there's the realm of religion, verse 20. Idolatry and witchcraft. Idolatry refers to uh, worshiping of any gods other than God. Witchcraft refers to uh, worshiping the powers of evil, which would include Things like Satan worship, fortune telling, black magic, seances, horoscopes, and such and such. Next, Paul moves to the realm of relationships. If you think, well, I don't think I do so bad with religion. I don't worship false gods. I don't worship the powers of evil. And sexually, I'm probably okay. Well, he'll catch you here in the realm of relationships. Verse 20 and 21. Hatred discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. These are all breakdowns in relationships. We fight with each other. Paul ends his list with the realm of chemical addictions, verse 21. Drunkenness, orgies, and the like. This covers alcohol and drug addictions. 
and the like signals that this is not meant to be an exhaustive list. Paul ends his words with, this, with the harrowing words, 21, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, the Greek is in the present tense, which means those who habitually live doing these things that we've just read through cannot hope to claim that they know Christ and expect eternal life. Then Paul turns his attention to nine qualities of the Spirit. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit. Why is it called fruit? Fruit tells us that this is something that the Holy Spirit grows in us. We are powerless to produce these character traits. The Holy Spirit has to do it in us and through us. The first one is the most important one, love. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Jesus says in John 13, 35, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. In Galatians 5, 14, just a few verses earlier, uh, the Apostle Paul says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, the other eight fruit are commentary on love, what it means to love. In 1998, Jory and I adopted Jamie, our eighth child from Vietnam. Jory is an adoption, leads an adoption agency and, and a humanitarian work, and uh, they adopted about 500 kids from Russia, about 500 from Vietnam. And shortly after we got Jamie, Jory said, I'd like to adopt another one. I said, we already have eight. Isn't that enough? No, I'd really like to do another one. So that was actually a source of tension in a, for a couple of years in our marriage. I was pretty adamant. She was pretty desirous. And uh, so I was coming up to her birthday and I thought, what could I give her for her birthday to express my love for her? And it dawned on me. She has so many times told me. And so I said, okay, we can adopt a ninth. And here came Erica. Where'd she go? Huh? Oh, okay. Well, I was going to tell a little story about her, but she, anyway. So, um, and Erica has just been a delightful child. I've never regretted that decision. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, he who loves his wife loves himself. Anytime you can do something to love your wife, you're, you're really, the payback is so great. And six months after uh, we had Erica, she was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. I thought, oh my goodness, we have such a busy family. This is never going to work. But she's just been a delight. Everybody's come together. She's probably everybody's favorite sibling. Uh, she's the happiest child of our nine. There's no, everybody agrees on that. Smiles all the time. Anyway, um, it was very much worth it. Okay, now I'm going to read these Fruit of the Spirit, and I want you just to kind of listen to them and see if are these true in your life? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, means patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It ends with self-control. Self-control is so tough. I came back to Michigan this summer and Jory had bought a jar, big jar, of chocolate covered caramels from Costco. And on the top there's just a little bit of salt. I mean, they are to die for. And her rule was you can only have one a day. I haven't told you this, but when I'd walk by the refrigerator knowing what was in there, I found it pretty tempting to Swipe a few extras. I'll tell you about one time, Jory and I exercised self-control and it paid off. When we met each other and began dating, we told each other that we both were committed 
to obeying God's design to save sex for marriage. It was hard to do, but we were both committed to that. And when we got married, uh, Jory said, yeah, you were so strong, I thought you were not interested. <laughs> you were like a monk. <laughs> but I tell you, it's, it's really paid off. I mean, in, in that commitment, I think Jory's been able to trust me that if you could control yourself that much with me for, what was it, a year and a half, um, then I can trust you with other women. Now, the wisdom today is, uh, ah, before you get married, you need to move in together, you know, to kind of see if you're compatible. And you ought to have sex, you know, you ought to be before you're married so you're experienced. But study after study show that people that engage in sex before marriage or live together before marriage, they have a higher rate of being unfaithful outside of their marriage and a higher rate of divorce. So that whole thinking has not worked out. Now, maybe like me, you've, you look at these lists of all the acts of the sinful nature and the fruit of the Spirit, and you may be a little discouraged, like, man, I have so few fruit of the Spirit, and I tend to do so many of the things in the list of the sinful nature. The Apostle Paul admitted, I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Can we develop the fruit of the Spirit? Can we gain victory over our sinful nature? Uh, can we experience victory in this conflict between the sinful nature and the spirit? Or are we destined to only know defeat? Is that all Christianity has to offer? A life of continual failure? We can experience victory. The Apostle Paul suggests three ways. And if you get anything out of this message, it would be these three things. They have all, just about everything to do with the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul mentions the Spirit seven times in ten verses. Galatians 5, 16 to 25. The first one is walk by the Spirit. Verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You're frustrated with... Giving in to the sinful nature over and over again, here's your first suggestion. Walk by the Spirit. It's in the active voice, which means it's something we do. It's our responsibility. The Spirit will lead us, but we have to walk by the Spirit. That's our job. The Holy Spirit provides the power, but we must do the walking. Walk is in the present tense, which means we have to do it every day. We have to recommit ourselves every morning. Help me to walk in your spirit. The Holy Spirit shows us the way of truth, but we have to walk in it. Picture a parent teaching a child to ride a bike. You, you walk alongside holding the, the seat, and they, they pedal and then eventually you let go, and then you stay with them. You run with them to make sure they don't fall. Likewise, we're riding the bike. We have to stay close to the Holy Spirit. He's the source of power. He's the one that can keep us out of trouble. So much of the way we experience life has to do with our attitude. The Holy Spirit shows us the right way to live, the right attitude to have. But we have to walk in it. Walk in that right attitude. Paul Osteen is Joel Osteen's younger brother. Joel Osteen pastors Lakewood Church in Houston, which is the largest church in the United States. He lives in Little Rock, Paul does, and he's a doctor. And when he was just finishing his residency and doing his first year, he was so busy running 80-hour weeks, and they had three kids under six. So he'd come home tired, and then he'd have to, you know, play with the kids, change diapers, get up in the middle of the night for feedings, and he was just thinking, I can't wait to get through this season of life. So he's doing appointments one day, and 
he met with an elderly woman who had just lost her husband. And he was hurrying, trying to make up for lost time. And he was hurrying out the door when she said, can I ask you a question? He sat down, he said, assume it would be a medical question. And she said, how are you doing? He said, the work is really heavy here at the hospital. A lot of stress. And then I got three young kids. I get home and I got to do all of that. And I'm just looking forward to getting through this. And not wanting to be rude, he asked her, and how are you? She said, I would give anything to be where you are. To hear the sounds of pitter-patter of children's feet on the floor. To be able to hold a baby in the middle of the night for feeding. Change diapers. So that night, Paul went home. The whole new excitement about changing diapers. I mean, what happened? He began to focus on the blessing rather than the burden. He got the right attitude. He walked in the right attitude that the Holy Spirit directed him to do. The second way we can experience victory is be led by the Spirit. Verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The verb led is in the passive voice, which means this is not something we do, but we let the Holy Spirit do to us. We let the Holy Spirit lead us. It's in the present tense, which means we have to do it continually. Every day when we get up, we have to say again, I commit myself to be led by you. Help me to be sensitive to your promptings. I have found that the Holy Spirit prompts me many times every day. That's for sure. The question is whether or not I will listen or if I'll just blow right by it. Jory's cooking dinner by herself. Get off your rear end and go help her. Don't yell at your kid. Encourage him. Make a phone call. I mean, I get a lot of those. When the Holy Spirit leads us, we must train ourselves to listen, to allow ourselves to be led. It's difficult to lead someone who doesn't want to follow. I often wonder how the Holy Spirit must feel when he prompts his children, and they ignore him over and over again. I was a swim, um, swimmer in high school and college, and I was a lifeguard in California at a river. It's a pretty big spot in the river, and um, so a lot of responsibility. I was delighted this summer. Uh, Jamie became a lifeguard, and she was a lifeguard at Lake Michigan. Uh, so she had a team of people, and about four would guard at a time, so she would sit on the chair with somebody else, or they had three different chairs. But I learned that it's a lot easier to save somebody when they're willing to be saved. Uh, when they're thrashing around, grabbing whatever they can, it's very difficult. It's difficult for the Holy Spirit to lead us if we don't want to be led. To overcome our sinful nature, to do our part in overcoming evil in the world by subduing our sin, we must make a decision to be led by the Spirit. In Galatians 5.25, Paul says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. We decide that we'll keep in step with the Spirit. We'll listen to His promptings. A third way we can experience victory is crucify the sinful nature. Verse 24, the Apostle Paul says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The verb have crucified is in the perfect tense, which means it, it talks about an action that took place in the past, but it has present implications. The action Paul's talking about is Christ's death on the cross. He came to die for all our sins. 
Since all our sins were there, in a sense, that means that you and I were there when Christ was crucified because our sins were there. They were crucified. When we commit our lives to Christ, we make a decision to turn from our sins that, that He died for, to repent of our sins and follow Christ. By choosing to repent of our sins and become part of Christ, we have crucified our sinful nature. We have crucified our sinful nature so we don't have to serve it any longer. The Vietnam War is kind of a dark part of our nation's history. The war started with the right idea. It was to stop communism. In those years, communism was spreading rapidly around the world, and so we wanted to stop it from spreading from North Vietnam to South Vietnam. But as the war ground on, our people, Americans, grew tired of the war. And our leaders grew tired of the war. And so by the end, we were just fighting a half-hearted battle, like, you know, soldiers with one hand tied behind their backs. Over 58,000 Americans died in that war, and many more came back with limbs lost and post-traumatic stress disorder. And what made it the worst is when the final ones came home, they didn't come home to rousing welcomes. Most Americans had forgotten Vietnam. And so they came back with, you know, feeling like, oh, what did we do that for? 1982, our country tried to make up for it a little bit when the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was erected. Etched in black granite are the names of 58,156 Americans who died in the Vietnam War. Some Venice, uh, it's been very meaningful for many, many people. Some just walk the long memorial. Some actually finger the names of their loved ones, maybe their husband or son or daughter or father. A lot of tears are shed there. But for three American soldiers, it has to be particularly poignant. Robert Bedker, Willard Craig, and Daryl Losh. For they can walk up to that long ebony wall and find their own names. Due to a coding error, they were listed as dead, even though they're alive. Dead but alive is a very good description of a Christian. We're alive to Christ, but dead to our old nature. Everyone knows that dead people don't sin. Once we understand that our old nature was crucified on the cross with Jesus, we can live as if we are dead to sin. Next time you're tempted, remind yourself that in Christ, you've already died to sin. You don't have to be mastered by your sinful nature any longer. You have crucified your sinful nature. Verse 24, Paul says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If you've committed your life to Christ, Paul is describing you. You have deliberately put to death your lower nature. The Roman crucifixion was a terrible way to die. And it reminds us that when it comes to our sinful nature, we need to deal with it pitilessly. The sinful nature is not something to be treated with courtesy, but something so evil it's to be crucified. Death by crucifixion was a certain death. We are to crucify our sinful nature just as decisively. If you have some sin that is dogging you, overwhelming you, defeating you, it suggests that you have not maintained your repentance. It is as if, having nailed our sinful nature to the cross, we keep wistfully returning to the scene of the execution. We begin to finger it. 
caress it, long for its release, even to take it down again from the cross. When some malicious or impure thought invades our mind, we must kick it out at once. It's fatal to begin to consider whether or not you're going to give in to the sinful nature. We've crucified the sinful nature. We are never going to draw the nails. How can we do our part in winning this worldwide battle against evil? How can we experience victory over our, the evil within our own lives? The victory is within reach of every Christian. We can experience victory if we walk in the Spirit. We deliberately walk in the path the Spirit has set out for us in the Bible. And we are led by the Spirit. We are sensitive to His promptings. And we crucify the sinful nature. If we've crucified the sinful nature, we must leave it securely nailed to the cross. We must not finger the nails. So when the devil comes and tempts us, we say to him, the Spirit dwells in me. I follow his leading and walk in his ways. I belong to Christ. I have crucified the sinful nature. It is altogether out of the question that I should ever dream of taking it down again from the cross. Lord Jesus, thank you for Paul's so helpful words. We all battle with evil. We battle with it right within ourselves every day. And we feel like failures so often. But we learn that we have the power within us, the Holy Spirit. We can walk in His ways. We can be led by Him. And we can remember that Jesus died for all our sins, so our sins really were crucified, and we can be dead to them. I want to give you an opportunity maybe to make that commitment, walk in the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, crucify the sinful nature. I think that would be helpful for every one of us here. For some of you, maybe you need to commit your life to Christ. You're not sure you've ever done that. And you're going to have to do that to get the Holy Spirit inside of you. Otherwise, you will have no power to do this. You can just invite Jesus right now to come in and thank Him for dying for you and ask Him to be your Lord and put His Holy Spirit inside you. For others of you, maybe this is the time to say, I want to walk by the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, and crucify the sinful nature. You pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for hearing our prayers and thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit who lives in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.